you're gonna go through three versions of your product no matter what anybody tells you. And by three versions, I don't mean iterations that are modifications, I mean you take the thing, you throw it out, you start all over again. My name is Miriam Turk, I'm co-founder and CEO of Clear Blue Technologies, and uh, very happy to be with you here today. If you are attending uh, this session, which is obviously about manufacturing, you are obviously thinking about doing something related to a hardware startup. And I want to tell you that um, if that is the case, you are walking into um, probably the most exciting, but uh, also you're talking about cowboy country. This area of technology development is currently probably the new frontier of what's happening in the marketplace. And there's three main reasons for it. Uh, the first, you'll have heard lots of articles about 3D printing, um, and sometimes it's hard to see how that changes your world in the office when you're building something, but the speed by which people are now able to build products is going times 10 faster than it ever has before. So you've got to go fast, you've got to be smart, and everybody's communicating with everybody else. The second reason why um, it's a really big challenge is that um, the underlying technologies and tools that you are using in order to build your product, the hardware platforms, the operating systems, the microprocessors, the communications networks, they are changing so quickly, it feels like, and I've got enough gray hair to remember this, it kind of feels like the first two years of the dot-com internet world. We're currently looking at building an embedded Linux version of our product, and every two months, the technology upon which we can build is changing radically. And changing radically in size, it used to be this big, and now it's the size of my thumb. In price, it's gone from $70 per unit down to $5 a unit. So how you can actually build a product on something that's changing that radically fast. And then the third piece is that almost everything that you're building is smart. It's no longer just hardware. It's hardware and software integrated together. And it's those three factors that makes this a very exciting world. Um, but there's not a lot of proven test cases. There's not a lot of websites. If there is one website that I do look at occasionally, I would encourage you to go to bolt.com, which is a, a startup incubator in Boston that is for hardware. That's why they call it Bolt. Um, and there's starting to be some blogs there that I find quite interesting. Just to give you a little bit of background about uh, Clear Blue, um, so there's, re there's consumer hardware products, there's many different sectors within the hardware product. Our hardware product, in my experience, is a business to business product. What we make is a power controller. It's that box that you see in the middle. It's not really pretty yet. It's got lots of super functionality, but it sits in the middle of a, of a pole, so nobody ever actually looks at the hardware product. What it does is it generates energy off of, the, uh, off of green energy supply, uh, sources like solar panels and wind turbines. It does energy storage management, and it powers uh, street lights and security cameras and railroad switching stations, basically our Internet of Things infrastructure. We've been in business for three years. We've been selling our product for just over a year and a half, and we have customers in 20 countries around the world. Every one of those systems everywhere in the world communicates wirelessly with our cloud-based software platform. So we're a hardware company, a software company, a communications company, an analytics company, a cloud company. Uh, welcome to hardware startups. Um, I'm going to talk about manufacturing supply chain, but I thought I would step up a little bit and just talk about some of the key factors, because if you're starting a company, you've got 10 dials who all have to work together, and they all enter a link. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on financial team product development before I get to manufacturing and supply chain. Um, if you're doing a startup, you're going to want to raise money. In order to raise money, you have to have a financial model that works, and there's a couple of contradictory messages. First is investors are looking for something that's got recurring revenue. So a lot of hardware products today are actually something that you would send out there in order to get the recurring revenue software experience. The most classic example would be Apple because I buy one iPhone every three or four years. 
but every day there's a little iTunes charge on my phone. And given that my daughter, who's 18, uses the same account as me, it happens quite frequently. But that recurring revenue model is something people want to see, and they don't want to see just one-time hardware. So hardware that then delivers an ongoing service or relationship or experience is a really strong driver in the business. They want to see high gross margins. So here's something that is a really interesting fact. If you manufacture it in-house, it's not cost of goods sold. You've got a couple of guys in the office that are doing some work in final assembly manufacturing in your thing. Those are part of your operations team and it's not cost of goods sold. If you outsource the contracting to a third party, it's cost of goods sold. So what we've decided to do is we outsource most of our manufacturing to a subcontractor. And one of the main reasons we do it is the last two points, low capex and short life cycle. But we do the last piece of manufacturer assembly and test in-house. And through that, we're going to be able to hit 60% gross margin. So when you decide what you outsource, you have to think about what your financial business model is going to look like. Um, Companies, investors want low capital expenditures. If you go to an investor and say, hi, we have to build a factory, we need $10 million, we have to start a building, uh, we need to buy all this manufacturing equipment, get our first production run out the door, and then we're going to sell, you are a better salesperson than me if you can get some money because nobody's going to give you any money for that model. Um, so you need to really look at something, a, a business model that allows you to have low cop, capex. And contracting out your manufacturing is actually a really good idea and a good way to do that. Uh, I will tell you that contracting out some of your research and testing is good as well. There are a lot of partnership opportunities with educational institutions. If you go to a college, for example, and say, I want to test and prototype my product, you can get government funding that they will give the college. So we, for example, we make solar-powered streetlights. I have at Centennial College today 10 solar uh, power streetlights, never paid for any of them. I don't have any CapEx on my budget. You have to be innovative about how you do those things. And then the last piece is you need to have a, a, a fairly short life cycle. Generally, investors are looking for, I'm start, I've got an idea, I'm going to fund this company, I'm going to get it up and running, it's going to burn negative cash for three years, and then it's got to be cash flow positive. So again, if you want to go build that factory and, and, and spend $10 million, that'll take a year and you're already out of the numbers. Um, one of the hardest things about being a hardware startup is uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I started off on the electrical side and I spent a lot of years on the software side. And I am still flabbergasted that the software guy doesn't know how to do electrical wiring and the electrical guy doesn't know how a computer works worth crap. I have two co-founders, one's a software guy, the other one's a power guy. Um, that goes times 10 in this world, because now the electrical guys have to talk to the mechies, and that doesn't work so well very often. You got the software guy that has to interact. Even when you can get those three people who are in the engineering or the research or the development department, in the hardware world more than anywhere else, and Harvey's list of, how, remember how he said every time, well, there's a list of 40 things and I don't usually give you 40 things? It's because in other startups, you don't have to then think about logistics and supply chain and manufacturing and design for manufacturability, design for quality assurance testing. So I'll give you an example. We have two versions of our product. One of them costs about $20 for my subcontractor to assemble and manufacture. The other one costs $100, even though it's a simpler product. One was designed for manufacturability, the other one doesn't, and we haven't even started. We could get it down to $5. So you've got to have the supply chain guy who can get you certain parts and components and the manufacturing guy sitting at the table with the mechanical engineer, the electrical engineer, and the software guy who all think that they're the smartest guy with the hardest problem and the other one. And getting that team to work, um, I, I, you remember the algae men are from Mars and women are from Venus? This is way worse than that. It's a lot of fun though, and I wouldn't do anything else with my life. So I don't take it as a negative, it, but it is a, a nice big challenge. I stole this from Bolt, uh, the, the site that I talked about. Hardware product development requires more planning than software development because of the sheer number of things that must be done right. It's unbelievable that you're, you know, you're prototyping, you've got a patent, you've delivered the software, you've done the hardware. 
packaging, logistics, retail. It'll even get to the point where somebody will start talking to you about if you make it this way instead of this way, we could get 1,000 of them on one skid instead of uh, 700 of them, which will drop your cost by 20%, et cetera, et cetera. It starts to get very complicated. Um, and these are all the things that you need to think about. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You're going to go through three versions of your product, no matter what anybody tells you. And by three versions, I don't mean iterations that are modifications. I mean you take the thing, you throw it out, you start all over again. And you look at the iPhone and you see how many times they've reinvented and changed that product completely from scratch. In version one, don't even worry about the bottom stuff. If you have to personally deliver it yourself and fly out to China to, to actually give it to the customer or buy the customer a, a bigger TV so you can put it inside you know, or beside it, like don't worry about that. Just worry about the first few pieces. But once you get to second and third iterations, you've got to start to think about all of the rest of that. How does it fit on the shelf at Best Buy if you're a retail product? OK, let's talk a little bit about manufacturing. Um, you really are going to go, people will talk about version three products and that's really the most mature version. You are going to throw your product out a couple of times and your team's going to be afraid to tell you that. They're, they're going to say, oh, I'm done. I've got it perfectly. I know exactly what we're doing. Probably not for version one, but for version two. And then they're going to come along a year later and say, no, 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 we got to throw it out. Create an environment and the culture where you allow that to happen. and. Move as fast as you can from step one to step two to step three. One of the things that I did, every time we did a product iteration and we did a manufacturing run, we did small quantities. And they'd come to me and say, but what if we need to make 100 this month or 1,000 this month? And I would say, I'd rather do five batches of 20 than 101 batch because you're going to want to change the product. And Caravis right, you do have to freeze the product before you go into manufacturing. So do really small manufacturing batches, as small as you can. And I never do a 100 unit batch until I've done a 30 unit of the exact same version. And I don't do the 1,000 unit batch till I've done the 30 and the 100 and then go to the 1,000. Because no matter how perfect you think it is, until you build it, it's actually wrong. Um, and find a contract manufacturer very close to you don't go to China right off at the beginning. Start in Toronto. There's a lot of manufacturing capability actually in southern Ontario from the old days, but because of Blackberry and Celestica um, and other areas, there are small hole in the wall, two guy, three guy shops who can build it. They're not going to need all the documentation. They're, not, they're just going to wing it with you, but they can iterate and get you a version of the product the next day so that you can keep testing and figure out whether it's going to work. Um, Supply chain is really, really, really important. Last night I went over the Bolt website um, because of uh, uh, this presentation. I wanted to put some things together. And I discovered a new source of supply components. And I was so excited, I sent an email to the whole company. Finding the location where you can go get this widget and order it in the size you want and get it the next day for five bucks. It's like, oh my God, saves you so much time. Uh, it's also very key to understand what you have to control when the technology is changing that quickly. So the general advice is, if you have high cost special or strategic components, keep control of them yourself. But the small stuff like resistors and your, your contract manufacturer say, well, let me do it for you, let me do it for you, because he wants to make a markup and it makes his life easier. Give him some of the commodity stuff, but the box, the key components, you need to maintain control of that and have that expertise uh, uh, in-house. Speaking of supply chain, so the one I'd never heard of before was McMaster Car. I, they both said, oh my god, we've got McMaster Car. It's actually in their presentation of how to do a startup. That's how important this stuff is. DigiKey, Amazon, these guys are really key to helping you get going. If you order DigiKey before 7 o'clock at night, 6.45, you make an order right now on DigiKey, it'll be in your office before 10.30 tomorrow morning. Your team can keep working. If you can find yourself a network, either in an incubator through Mars or in other locations, or make sure that your employees do have that capability in-house, knowing where to get that little stuff really cheap and figuring it out helps you move 10 times faster and it gets your brain flowing and you learn a lot about those things. 
Um, the last key thing I will tell you is make sure you're innovative. So I'll give you two examples of how my team's been innovative. Had a treadmill, which we were throwing out, and we were trying to do testing of a wind turbine. Well, wind turbine generator goes up, and it goes down when the wind hits. So I come into the office one day, and some guy's taking a treadmill apart, and he's using the, you know, 10, you know how you can increase the treadmill to run faster and faster and faster? Well, he used that to create a wind generator test set in order to test our product. So I've got it sitting in the corner built around a, a thing. Couldn't, we'd been looking for a wind generator test set for six months. This is an IKEA garbage bin basket turn, that's made out of metal. When you turn it upside down, load in a few resistors and add a few switches, you have a load resistor test uh, bank. So those are the kinds of guys you want to have in your team or people who can think about that. 